Hello, I'm Amy Farris, coordinator of the Brookdale Visiting Artist Program. The Visiting Artist Program seeks to bring established and emerging artists into the art department at Brookdale to interact with students, faculty, and the local community. The program has two pieces, a hands-on workshop for students with the visiting artist and a free public lecture given by the artist on their work and process. These public lectures take place in the Center for Visual Arts Gallery on Brookdale's Lincroft campus. This wonderful program is completely funded through private donations and through a 2014 Monmouth County Arts Council grant. In order to keep it alive and growing, we need your help. Won't you please consider making a donation in any amount so that we can continue to bring these incredible artists into our community. For information on how to give your support and to view a calendar on upcoming visiting artist events, please visit the Brookdale Art Department webpage on the Brookdale website and click on Visiting Artist Program. Thank you. Hello, I'm Amy Farris. Welcome to the Brookdale Visiting Artist Program. We're here today in the Center for Visual Arts Gallery with artist Nell Painter. Nell, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Uh, you are here today, Professor Painter, as um, emerging artist. Um, and I, I was thinking about the word emerging um, this morning as we, I was preparing for our, our day. All artists emerge to some degree. They are on a journey. You have been on quite a journey to reach this point, I think, as a, as a visual artist. You refer to yourself as the painter formerly known as the historian. And in fact, you have had a long and distinguished career as a scholar and a writer for American history, specifically uh, American Southern history. Can you share a little bit uh, with us today your story of how you got to the space where you are now creating within the visual arts? It's a long story. Uh, but let me try to keep it short. And I also will tell you that the um, that Prince inspired me. Oh, uh, right, we talked about that. Yes, yes I do. I want yes. to mention that though, because yes. they, the the painter formerly known as the yes, historian, exactly. I knew he thought of Prince. Yes. And so that's sort of a nod. And he made his glyph as a visual thing yes. as well. Yes. Uh, in the 1960s, when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley, I was an art major, and actually I was the art director for the humor magazine. You were. But then I got a C in sculpture, <laughs> and I thought, oh, I don't have enough talent. Now, I didn't do any work, <laughs> but I thought, oh, I don't have enough talent, so I can't do this. I come from an academic family, a writing family. I could write. I knew how to write. Everybody said, you're a great writer, so that's the way I went. Mm -hmm. And that went on for a very long time. And then uh, the books that I started in the 90s and the early 2000s were very visual. Uh, uh -huh. Sojourner Truth with the chapter on photography, which really took me into the wonderful art history library at Princeton. Yeah. And I just loved working there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the uh, Creating Black Americans. Yes. Uh, it's a, a narrative history, it's not an art history, mm -hmm. but all the images are black fine art. Yes. So I gave myself a kind of quick and dirty, um, I mean really very partial mm -hmm. um, course in African American art history. Mm -hmm. I knew there was such a thing. Yes. I mean, I had grown up with some of this art, but yeah. there was so much more I hadn't known about it mm -hmm. until I applied myself to it. And then The History of White People, my most recent book, yes. uh, I finished during the time that I was in art school. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, yeah. you said while well, you were in art school, and I think what I kind of want to point out is that you went back to school. I did. You got, I you did. got your BFA from Mason Gross. Yes. And an MFA. Yes. From RISD. That's so right. So you not only did you just, the BF, you went and got the master's degree as well. Yes. And, yes. And, you felt a need to do this, to go I back did. to school. I didn't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know anything. I knew enough as a grown-up yes. not to think in the way I had in the 60s. Ah, oh, if you don't do any work, that means... Well, I didn't think like that anymore, that yeah. it was all about genius, all about talent, and so forth. I yes. knew as a grown-up that the way to get something done right is to work at it. Yes. And one of my most prized uh, designations is 
dogged. I mean, this was applied <laughs> to me, not, not as a prize. It was applied to me by somebody who thought that old-fashioned way. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, I realized that uh, you know, doggedness is what gets through Mm -hmm. You mentioned being on a journey. I don't feel like I've been on a journey. No. I just wobble around. <laughs> a journey can be circular and wobbly. Right. That's, that's, there are many different kinds of journeys and many different kinds of emergences, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you um, and you've taught as well. You're, you're a professor at uh, Princeton. Yeah. And, um, and we'll be again. And we'll be again. Yes, yes that's right. In 2015, that's you'll right. be teaching a course in uh, the uh, in African American, American studies. studies. It's going to be called art school. That's right. Yeah. And the students will actually make art, and read about art, and talk about art, and uh, their their art, uh, specifically the portraits and self portraits, because. Those bring up so many issues in African American studies in American yes. culture. It's an identity. It, yes. It, yes. Yes. And how you envision that. It's going to be the first show in the Haynes Building, um, which will be a brand new, beautiful, big art space in Newark I've heard in you. January 2016. That's, that's so exciting. And yes, I, it I, is. You know, this kind of leads us into my next question, actually, mm -hmm. the, the, the idea of. Um, sort of revisioning and self-portraiture, yes. because in your artist statement, uh, you say that you use found images yes. and digital manipulations yes. to reconfigure the past yes. and to revision yourself That's right. through self-portraiture. Yes. I kind of like to focus on the reconfiguring of the past, and yes. I, I can't help it. It's, it's the connection to your sure. historical background, and I, which I know must inform the work that you do. It's been such a large part of your life. So I'm assuming that it, it does inform somewhat your mm -hmm. approach to the mm -hmm. visual arts. Um, so in your opinion, as an academic historian, I, I guess there's two questions. Is history static? Can no. it be redefined? History is always being redefined. Because when you think about what goes on in life, there's so much that goes on in an individual life, in a community's life, in a state's life, in a nation's life. It's just... It's infinite. Yeah. So what historians do is decide what's important and then construct a narrative. So that narrative changes by when you're writing. So for instance, um, in the 1960s and 70s, the Vietnam War uh, influenced how American historians were writing about yeah. American history. And um, right now, uh, Ferguson and then the Garner killing in New York. Yes. You know, these are influencing how people, including historians, see the world around them and see the past. So yes, the past changes. The past changes. Now, that's in scholarly history, the past changes. For me now as an artist, I can do whatever I want. So yeah, it's I not, wondered. <laughs> it's not scholarly narrative history. It's fiction. Okay, it's and fiction. that's where I kind of want. I want. It's and a that's comparison where I am now. between. Yes. And, the, and this, is it a different feeling of freedom creating these? I yes. mean, you have a piece. It's called Art History, yes. Volume. I think it's twenty-seven. I had that's to go right. back and remember my <laughs> yes. no, Roman numerals. Yes. Um, by Nell Painter. That's right. Ancestral art. Yes, right. And you call it the Staples Edition. It's a Staples Edition because it was printed at <laughs> it's, Staples. It's fantastic. But it's given this, you know, Staples yeah. Edition, this yeah. sort of weighty title, yeah. and it's. It's a it's a collection of collages yes. and it's and it's African American artists and I and I I guess it's I, not just African and not just music. because there's yeah, a there's an art historian German artist. yes and yes that's right and you have a, a German I believe art historian it's it's Carl Einstein I that's think right. is in there that's right and I must thank you first of all because you educated me just looking through these there's so many yeah. artists I didn't know about exactly um, and and so this is is this your narrative of art history, I guess, is yes, it you is. felt the freedom to create uh, that. I was just talking about this at Princeton two days ago, and I hadn't been back to the, I've been back to Princeton mm -hmm. in the last 10 years, but not to the history department. Okay. So I was talking to the history department for the first time in nearly 10 years. And so they were asking me some of these same questions, but from history's point of view. Okay. And uh, one very smart young man, who's actually a math major, uh, asked a question that I've been asked several times, and it's in here with your questions as well, slightly differently, uh, which is, 
And I always had a lot of trouble answering this question. I couldn't quite hear it. And it's, it comes down to how does visual art change your scholarly history? Mm. And I couldn't hear it because I don't do scholarly history anymore. No. <laughs> I do historical fiction. fiction. Okay. So in that sense, the images make my historical fictions. However, the kicker is that, for instance, for Art History Volume 27, and people said, oh my gosh, I missed the earlier volumes. <laughs> <Right. I'm like, laughs> no, no, there aren't any earlier volumes. Right. That's just in case, you know, so sure. I want to go back and sure. do the Odalisque or something like that. <laughs> right, right. Maybe she'll be volume 18 or something like that. <laughs> but at any rate, um, I, I did do research. This uh, art history came out of a talk that I did at the Metropolitan Museum several months before that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wanted to say something really historical. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the art history uh, library at Princeton and rooted around, and I discovered that one of the crucial artists for the Harlem Renaissance was German, Nitold ah. Rice. Right. So, uh, so he's actually pictured in there. Mm -hmm. um, so that is actual research. So in some ways, I am still doing actual research. But no, I'm doing historic. What am I doing? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? It's, 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 it, yeah. But that, that must be a creative sense of excitement, this, what am I doing? Where am I going? Yes, Where is this? and it was a Where source of great trouble of, until the summer of 2013 when I did that little book. Because when I was in art school, particularly at the Rhode Island School of Design, people kept slapping me down. You can't do history. You can't do text. You can't do narrative. The piece must come out of art. Maybe one part of the problem is that art, as art defines, doesn't have space for narrative and doesn't have space for history and doesn't have space for politics mm -hmm. because all that stuff is considered politics or illustration. <laughs> such a, sometimes that's yeah, such a dirty yeah, word connected with the worse, fine arts. Design. Right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but that's so much of what African-American art and artists are interested in. So it was always a struggle uh, to, to want to say something about the world and then be kept from doing it, and also hear in so many different ways that that is wrong, mm. that is not art. So I can't, I'm embarrassed to say how influenced I was by that, mm -hmm. how naive I was. I remember one visiting artist came through, and in the studio, he's looking at uh, something that I had done, and he's saying, why did you stencil in that way? I said, because one of the teachers suggested. He said, why are you listening to teachers? <laughs> <laughs> and here I came from a teaching institution. Sure. Yeah. The whole point was to listen to teachers. That's so right. that was really hard. Isn't it? Yeah, it's, you get a, it's a totally different uh, mindset. It's yes. amazing. Yes. The, the grooves we sometimes get yes. into without realizing it. We're, we're, we're coming to the end of our time, and I, I did want to quickly, I guess, at this point ask you, you, you use a, in your process, you use a combination of digital media with more traditional painting techniques, yes. but a lot of collage work. Yes. Uh, you've, you've and cited, painting. And painting. Just painting. Yeah. And one of your references you cite, I, I want to get his name in here, is it, am I pronouncing it correctly, Beaufort Delaney? Beaufort Delaney. Beaufort Delaney. Yes. It was one of your influences. And yes. you can see his influence in yes. your work, your, your yes. beautiful colors and your yeah. collage. Digital media. Yes. Um, is, it, is it simply a tool that allows you to get the visual you want, or is there a, a conceptual portion to your it's choice both. of digital media? It's both. It started as a tool to just mess up the images, okay. to pull me out of sort of controlling the images, because there's so much going on you can't control, or I can't control, with digital. Uh, and so it was, it was a, a tool for composing new images, but it became a way of seeing my fictions. Okay. So now digital is very much a part of the way I do art, um, but going back and forth, because I still love the trace of the hand. Yes. I still love texture. The feel. Um, the knitter in me still loves 
what you can almost feel, the hand you can feel making the textile, making the cloth, making the little hat or whatever yeah. it is. So that it's both sides going together and using them together with this push-pull back and forth lets me do both things. Thank you so much, Nell, for being with us today and answering yeah. these, these questions and for talking about your work and, and your background. Um, and we're off to do a workshop with the students yes. in which we're going to let them push and pull That's between right. digital and, uh, and acrylic so media. I'm looking forward to that. We are too. We're so excited. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you once again for joining us for the Brookdale Visiting Artist Program. Uh, stay tuned for some scenes from the workshop that Nell will be doing with um, some graphic design students here at Brookdale. Thank you. This is not your ordinary community college. This is an education for the 21st century, a college that learns from industry trends and adapts to the changing job market. This is a group of acclaimed professors and a staff who will stand at your side and help you kick down any door you choose. This is where you can learn a new skill or earn a degree, online or in person, at six locations across Monmouth County. This is not your ordinary community college. This is Brookdale. This is college redefined. This is success reimagined. Minds can achieve anything. We make sure they get to college. Federal student aid provides more than $150 billion in grants, loans, and work-study funds to make college possible for anyone with the mind to get there. Because if given the chance, Minds will do great things. Federal Student Aid, proud sponsor of the American Mind. Learn more about money for college at studentaid.gov. So we're working digital and manual. And I want to show you where I started. I, you all have uh, on your flash drive or in your head or printed out on a piece of paper an image, right? Yes. <laughs> so these are just um, sketches by hand. So this is part of the manual side, sketch by hand, manual, and that's the size they are. Um, sketch by hand, manual, and so this is kind of raw material. That's one part of the raw material. You all have your images. This is another one, part of the raw material. And this is with one of those brushes that has teeth. And uh, these are um, colored inks. These are actually, they're not exactly the same as this, but it's like that. Uh, and just, these are things that I can cut up. So what I did, um, working off these with uh, my computer, this is a digital collage that uses this and this and this. So this eye here, that's this. Uh, repeated and symmetrical. I, I like to make diptychus, so this is kind of like that. You all probably know about using digital media better than I do. You're probably much more sophisticated with the things that you can do. But I want you to keep coming back and forth with the manual. Any questions?
I hope that this has added something to your arsenal uh, in terms of uh, making art, that there's some things that you can do only by your hand and, and by cutting, taking out, and then by collaging and putting back. And uh, especially uh, where you can see, so let's use Sue's again. You see how the difference between how flat the paper is that came out of the printer and what it looks like from your hand. And when you frame this, which I hope you will do, you get a good framer who will flatten it out enough so that it doesn't touch the, the glass because paper is very fugitive. Uh, if you keep something that you've made in paper, even if you're using archival inks, paper fades, so it's, it's uh, fragile. So it needs to be away from the glass, but part of the affect of this piece is its bumpiness. So your framer should keep some of that bumpiness so that you can see um, the shadows of where the paper is not flat, sorry, <laughs> not flat uh, against the, the glass or against the frame. One of the great things uh, that we have here, and this is a very nice piece, um, is that we can see the different levels. And that's part of using a good heavy paper, that this is not the same as this, and you can see where this is added. So this is actually a design element of adding. So some uh, people, for instance, um, a woman who draws, actually she's considered a painter, Don Clemens, she makes great big room-sized drawings, but she pastes the paper together so you see these seams, and that is part of the beauty of the piece. I, I couldn't see this before, before you talked about it, um, but the way that this comes out and kind of exceeds the painted frame as well. So that's something you can see much more, well, it doesn't exist here, right. but you can see it much more clearly in the original than you can here. Uh, and Mark? Manny. Manny um, spoke very well about the difference here. But this is something that I, you could do this manually, but it would be really hard, It'd be really, really hard. So this is a great use of digital manipulation on you know, what's a very interesting piece anyhow. And here, I mean, I thought this was somebody uh, in a bobsled. So <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't matter. I mean, one of the beauties and one of the differences between making, writing history and scholarship, which is what I used to do, and making art is that as a historian, I would write in such a way that I would take you by the hand and you would agree with me. And so I would make the meaning and you would absorb it. But in art, you do make a piece and you add your meaning. You, know, uh, you said that you wanted to make a galaxy. Did you say that? No? Oh, you, is this you? Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. There's the green square behind it was supposed to be a galaxy, but I think yeah. the, the mummy is the movie. Yeah, OK. I like the way it yeah, I, I like the mummy better. OK. I like the mummy. And if we had a long, longer, I'd ask you all more about how you choose your original image and what drew you to it. But so for you, it's a mummy. And for me, it was a guy in a bobsled. But you know, <laughs> that's OK. That's true. And then there was something else. Oh, yes, in this one, the, um, the Empire State Building, uh, which is a pure, this is yours? Yeah. yeah, which is a purely visual element. It makes no sense other than visually. And it works. If, if a whole bunch of people came to you and they said, I just love that, I want to have it, so you have one now. What happens if I come to you and I say, I really want one, and I'll pay you $800 for it? Then what do you say? <laughs> no? You say no? If I really like it, then No, but it's a digital image. You could make a thousand, but you don't. What you do is addition it. Um, those of you who are printmakers, or this may happen also, uh, I don't know if this happens in design, but certainly in printmaking, that if you have made an 
um, image that you can reproduce, in, like a digital image you can reproduce infinitely, you addition it. So if you want it to keep its value, that is, it's $800 and more, then you say it's an addition, say, of 10. That's what I use. I make additions of 10. And so this is one of 10. The one I buy from you will be two of 10. And you'll keep a count, so you'll know how many you've done. And then other people come to you and they say, here's the $1,000, and then you know, <laughs> here's the thir three of 10. And then when you get to the 10th one, that's it. You don't do any more. Uh, but that's part of the language of printmaking, which digital pieces belong to, really. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you know, everybody's always saying painting is dead, but painting is not dead. Painting is not dead. Okay, thanks. Thank you. <laughs>